This is the story of the logs of the Northeast. Logs for lumber, logs for pulpwood and paper, products that enter the daily life of people everywhere. It's the story of the hard work of men of the Northeast and of the machines that make men's work easier. It's the story of wholehearted cooperation that's typical of the Northeast. And it's the tunity within the grasp of many men who live and work in her rolling hills. An opportunity that many have already accepted by making timber a perpetual crop on their farm acres, which the Creator intended for us to use, but not abuse. Forests are renewable, nation's only renewable natural resource. It's up to us to protect them, to use them wisely, and to profit by their use. Timber, any farm crop, it requires good growing, harvesting, conservation, and marketing practices. In the Northeast, in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Northern New York, lie some 37 and a half million acres of forest and farm forest lands. In these forests and on these farms live one and a quarter million people who depend to a large extent on the forest industries for their livelihood. In these four states are 254 paper and pulp mills with a total capacity of over three and a half million tons of paper and paper products annually. There are 2,554 sawmills, which produce almost a billion and a quarter board feet of lumber each year. located in and near the forests are many cooperage plants, box factories, novelty mills, and dozens of allied industries. Over 48,000 people work in these industries, turning out goods worth over $132 million. No matter what the crop on a well-managed farm, careful planting is required. The soil must be conserved, and cultivation is needed before a valuable crop can be harvested. In fire prevention, in the proper planting of the seedling trees, in thinning the struggling young trees, and in selective cutting, insect and disease control, farmers and the men of forest protection agencies are cooperating to produce a steadily increasing amount of wood. And therein lies one of the greatest opportunities for farmers of the Northeast, the opportunity to provide a generous supply of wood for their own use, a continuous supply of wood and lumber for the expanding housing and home repair needs of the nation, and cash in the bank for the family. Boys and trees both thrive in New England and under precisely the same sort of care. The seedling tree and the stripling boy will arrive at maturity together. Someday on his own well-managed timberland, the boy turned man may produce the wood that makes the boxes and cases and crates and barrels and even paper bags that carry the food that people eat and the buildings that people work in to speed the commerce of the nation. Millions of feet of logs roll from New England farms the year round. No matter how the job is done, logging follows the same simple pattern. Trees are selected for price, ease of removal, and conservation of timber supply. Then they are felled, limbed, bucked, and sent off to the mill. Farmers often work with their wives 
and with her children, or a neighbor or two. Even blind men learn their way around the friendly woods and do the work of logging with the meticulous care of the sightless, the care that adds to the value of the timber crop. By and large, the bulk of the farmer-produced logs and other forest products are turned out by hand with hand tools. The companies, besides using hand tools and horses in most of their operations, also use mechanized power equipment, such as this small chain saw, and tractors and other heavier machinery where practical. The underbrush is cleared from around trees to be felled in order to avoid accidents. For after the undercut is made and the giant starts its plunge to the ground, a man may need space to move quickly. Logging has been practiced in New England for 300 years. Complex and many times difficult operations are simplified by the experience gained in those centuries. Even horses know their jobs and often work alone to help start the pulpwood bolts on their long and colorful journey to the faraway mills. Logging methods and machines have been developed over the years to fit the unique needs of lumber harvesting. Modern engineering has increased the efficiency of operations in the woods and of the transportation and handling of the woods products. This cable snubber, attached to the pulpwood train, for example, was designed to keep the train from running away down the hill. After bolts are towed on the frozen lakes, another specially developed machine is used to dump the train onto the ice, where the spring thaws will set the bolts on their journey to the mills, the most spectacular phase of the whole logging operation. As the spring drive begins, the cookhouse, or wangan as it is called, is prepared to follow close behind. Sometimes it is drawn by team, sometimes by truck, and frequently by boat, but always well stocked with good food and the makings of good food. The cooks are able craftsmen and know how to fill the bellies of hungry loggers with food that sticks to the ribs and tickles the taste. Food that brings the men a-running when chow is served up. It takes a lot of good food to push a million logs and a hundred ravenous river men and a fleet of bateaux down a roaring river. A lot of bread and cookies and pie, and cake. A day on the drive only a river man knows. And it ends when a driver can't tell a log from a shadow. And that's a long day. But there are four squares a day. Breakfast, first lunch, second lunch, and supper. 
to help a man with his work. And, of course, this coffee, the banter of men who work in harmony, and cigarettes. After the snows and rains fill the dammed up streams, comes the moment in spring when the rivers reach driving pitch. The floodgates are open. The pulpwood bolts are put afloat, and once again, New England logs and pulpwood bolts begin their tumbling trip to the mills miles away. New Englanders know the sight and sound of bucking logs and swirling waters. For centuries, they have watched the products of their timberlands plunge toward the distant mills and factories of the nation, there to be transformed into a host of products, a growing host of products that make comfort and beauty and utility and jobs for millions in and out of New England. Along the river bank, Pulpwood boats wait quietly for the water to rise and float them away, while elsewhere, men work to heave them into the stream. In no time, it seems, first lunch is on the way, carried to the men where they are tending out. But when the logs are running, there's no time to fool away with lunch hours. A man must get his logs downriver to the booms with the spring high water, or he waits until fall, or worse yet, until another spring. To leave a drive dry on the meadows or stranded in the shallows is a tragedy not only to the boss, but to every man on the crew. The rushing waters of a swollen stream won't wait. Logs must be peevied off the stacks and into the water by the expert twist of a practiced hand and bulging muscles of sweating men. Or the donkey engine must drag the logs off the cold deck and into the water after the cables have been made fast in just the right places to the satisfaction of the donkey operator. It's time for the second lunch of the busy day. More food, tasty, hot, cooked right to the queen's taste, and even to queenie's taste. But the river and the logs run on, minute after minute, hour after hour, mile after mile. And the river drivers check off the miles and take stock of the progress of the bolts and the logs as the swirling water rushes them ever onward. But in the quiet lakes along the way, the water slows down and the nervous logs relax and ride calmly. And then they begin to scatter over the water, straying from the course they must follow. So ingenious rivermen have worked out a way to corral the straying wood. They surround it with a net boom, lasso the loose logs, keep them on their course, and send them off again, once more, down the stream. And as the sun slowly sinks, the men still work to keep the logs moving so there won't be so many overnight jams that have to be broken up in the morning to keep the logs hurrying on their way. When everything is riding right, the racing logs roll and pitch and nudge each other along the twisting miles. All that's required of the men while the drive is moving right is a little watchfulness and a lot of walking. 
And once in a while, there's a wild ride in a bateau, but only for the expert. But a drive is not all rushing logs in beautiful New England countryside. All too frequently, the bucking logs seem to develop an almost human obstinacy, a desire to go their independent ways, to be as individualistic as the proud New England people. And then men must work hard and work fast to prevent a jam, or with long experience skill, find the key log and break the jam. Yes, sir, these men can ride them through white water and green. It's a dangerous job. It takes experience and care to avoid accidents. But the good drivers don't take the chances that lead to trouble. The awkward bateau comes alive and graceful in the hands of drivers who must get there in a hurry when the logs demand it. slips and rips when wet boots dance on slippery logs. But the work goes on and on, and the logs roll on and on, except when they stop, as if to watch the struggling men hard at work. When the logs hang on the banks, the river men call the jam a wing. And when they hang up in the middle of the river, the men call such jams centers. On and on the logs go riding. At times it seems as if nothing will stop them. But that is just the time the drivers grow most watchful, studying the drive from every angle, straining their eyes for the first sign of the jack straw log that upends its dripping body from the mass below and jams the smooth progress of the drive. Then, amid the creaking and groaning of logs ground together by the force of the piling water, men work in a hurry to fuse and tie the dynamite that will free the key log. It takes the experience of years on the logs to know just where to place the dynamite so that when the logs fly from the thunder of the explosion, they will keep going when they land again in the swirling water. Although the stately raft of cedar telephone poles ignores such rough and tumble. Finally, the paper mill and journey's end. Then the logs go to the cold pond if they're to be stored, or they're put in the hot pond for an immediate ride up the clanking conveyor to the mouth of the mill. Sometimes the bolts are put in a pile so the drag can pull them to the mill's mouth. Some mills load their conveyors from cars. In many parts of New England, 
The distance is great enough to make it worthwhile for farmers to truck their wood to rail sidings and ship it to the mills by freight. From farmers who live nearby, the mills often receive wood direct by truck. Often, the wood is unloaded in bundles. And sometimes, pulp wood arrives by barn. But whatever the method used to ship the wood, paper turned out in huge plants that run the year around remains one of the most important of the many products made from New England wood. Paper and paper products play a vital part in the everyday life of millions. Without paper and the host of other forest products, we could not maintain, let alone increase, the high American standard of living that, among other things, brings us the newspapers and periodicals that keep us the best informed people of the world. The best continued land use on much of our farm acreage is the growing of trees. County agents, foresters, mill representatives, and farm leaders are eager to help. For our own welfare and our posterity, we must follow a sound plan of timberland management, planting, thinning, selective cutting, fire prevention, and other improved practices. Effective farm forestry management is as easy as ABC. So follow these simple but important principles. A, help to meet the needs of our industries and their workers. They convert the raw materials of our timberlands into manufactured articles. These workers make the market for many of our other farm products. B, protect our natural forest acres against the ravages of destruction and permit increased growth to safeguard our land our welfare, and our future. C, make timber a crop. Utilize our farm forest production to the greatest possible good to ourselves and our country. Farm organizations, extension service, federal and state foresters, schools, and the forest industry understand the land, the people, and the timber of New England. They stand ready to give advice, help, guidance on the management of timber land. They know what to cut, how much to cut, and how best to sell. Profit from their advice. Remember, timber is a crop. hard work of men of the Northeast and of the machines that make men's work easier. It's the story of wholehearted cooperation that's typical of the Northeast. And it's the tunity within the grasp of many men who live and work in her rolling hills, an opportunity that many have already accepted by making timber a perpetual crop on their farm acres, which the Creator intended for us to use but not abuse. Forests are renewable, nations and farm forest lands. In these forests and on these farms live one and a quarter million people who depend to a large extent on the forest industries for their livelihood. In these four states are 254 paper and pulp mills with a total capacity 
of over three and a half million tons of paper and paper products annually. There are 2,554 sawmills, which produce almost a billion and a quarter board feet of lumber each year. Also located in and near the forest are many cooperage plants, box factories, novelty mills, and dozens of allied industries. Over 48,000 people work in these industries, turning out goods worth over $132 million. of the logs of the Northeast. Logs for lumber, logs for pulpwood and paper, products that enter the daily life of people everywhere. It's the story of the only renewable natural resource. It's up to us to protect them, to use them wisely, and to profit by their use. Timber, any farm crop, it requires good growing, harvesting, conservation, and marketing practices. In the Northeast, in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and northern New York, lie some 37 and a half million acres of forest. 